Welcome to How We Grow, an essential playbook to grow and scale your vacation rental business with advice and insights from the best in the biz with your host, Linnell Gordon. Welcome to How We Grow, the vacation rental show. I am so honored to have John Suzuki back with us. Now, John, you have your own podcast, and I alluded to it the last time we talked, but I didn't even mention it. (laughs) I want you to tell people about your podcast because it's your passion too. Yeah. So my podcast is called Finding Better. And my YouTube channel, if you're interested, is Finding Better Podcast. But, you know, I've dedicated 100% of my life, and I am now into it, of making the world better. I think it's a shared purpose for all of us to make the world better than the day we landed on it. And so my podcast is just part of that effort to do that. And the whole idea is sharing experiences, not opinions, not theory, not academics, but real life experiences of myself and my guests of things that we've done in our lives as we've sought to find better and what we learned and the experiences that we had and sharing those experiences so people can you know, consider them and consider incorporating them into their own life. So it's a lot of fun. And yeah, if I help lift the life of one person, you know, lifting the lives of others is lifting the world. And so it's just my little way of giving back. I find that fascinating. Let me tell you why. And I didn't know that, John. You know, I'm helping my husband. And I just really felt like for many years that God had called me to share with people my experiences of what happened with me in business Mm -hmm. in order to encourage you know, I was a single mom, but to encourage others as a whole, because every time I say women, Nehemia, my husband always says to me, well, what about men? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm not really excluding men. I look at it from a woman's point of view, of course, a woman in business and how God walked me through those circumstances in my life. And I've said to my mother, my mother and father both taught Bible. My husband teaches. I, on the other hand, I said, I can't do that. I can only share my experience. You know, every time, like yesterday, when I did a quick devotional on how to enjoy your life, because we get caught up so much. And that's one of the real passions of my life is how do you enjoy all that you've got, all that God has given to you in this life and what you have or what you've earned and you've worked hard for. So that's cool that it's about experiences. I'm really looking forward to being on that podcast, too. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about how you share your experiences and you focus on your experiences. A very dear friend of mine once told me as we were having a conversation that was starting to heat up a little bit, John, he says, you know what? I could care less about your opinion. I said, wait, what? Are you serious? And he says, yeah, listen. He says, I could care less about your opinion, but I'll listen to your experiences all day long. And I went, ooh. And so that was part of the genesis of Finding Better. And if you want more information on it, you can go to johnsuzuki.com. But it's it's just been a major, major joy. And there's so many people. Everybody wants to share something, right? Because everybody wants to help make the world better in their own little way. And, you know, giving back that way just by sharing your experiences really helps. There's another reason for sharing experiences. So I was in Israel on October the 7th. When the bombs were flying and we were in bomb shelters. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I went down to where the survivors, they had to take them out of the area, of course, next to Gaza, where they'd seen their families murdered and they'd seen a lot of things there. And I think that there are lots of reasons you share your experiences, but I went down to take down testimonies from those who had been traumatized because My father was killed in a terrorist attack in front of me. Actually, they broke in to our home. This is years ago when I was a young woman and there were terrorists from Nicaragua. So I related to these people. So another reason to share experience is it's healing. Yeah. So there are people that might want to come on the show, people that just might want to talk about things because it's healing to them. And if you've been through difficult situations in work, you know, that have really traumatized you business wise. It does help to talk about those experiences. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a book about those experiences because it's important that we share yeah. when we've gone through a difficult situation and we've come out of it. I think as property managers, being able to share with others those difficult situations you've been through, it really does help other people. Oh, absolutely. And you know, sometimes healing can be really hard, right? And sometimes, you know, really, really bad stuff happens and you don't want to talk about it. Or you do. I mean, or you do. 
You tell strangers, you tell everybody. Yeah, you that's hear right. It's another way. It depends on how you handle the trauma. That's right. And so that's very insightful. Thank you for that. So a lot of people might want to come on your show. Your show could be very healing to people, I guess, is where I'm coming. You know, I never thought about that, Linnell. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it. You know, it's make the world better and heal the world. And one of my favorite songs is by Michael Jackson, you know, Heal the World. Of course. And you mentioning that is right in the center of what I'm doing, and I didn't know that. So thank you for bringing that to the forefront of my consciousness. <laughs> I appreciate that. Let's talk about how we can intentionally make this world a better place. So mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about sharing our experiences, because that does make the world a better place. It teaches people, tell me about this, because you've done, obviously, because this is your thing, you've done a lot of study. For me, it would be a lot intention. I would get up in the morning and intentionally think about it. Is that part of the process? Yes. And also from my experience and from my studies, it all starts with intention. But actually, there's a step before the intention, and that is the awareness of intention, right? The awareness of intention. And a lot of us live our lives without really knowing what we're doing because we're just living our lives. But having the awareness of the intention of wanting to make our world a better place. Usually it's in the back of our minds and we think about it at some point in time, gosh, someone's got to do something about this, right? But when you bring it to the forefront of our minds and say, you know what? This world is screwed up. No, it's true. <laughs> I mean, this world is screwed up and I can do something about it. And, you know, I believe that, let me just give you an idea. Let me just give you an analogy, okay? On my podcast, I talk about finding better money and it's a multi-part segment, if you will. And one of the things I say is, you know, wealth is not about how much money you make. Wealth is about how much money you keep. And the interesting thing about it, speaking of intention, is that we all know we got to save money. We all know that we have to, right? But here's the thing. We spend, let's say, 40 hours a week working. We spend 40 hours a week working on making money. How much time do we spend per week focused on figuring out how to keep it? If a person spent 1% of their working life focused on how to keep their money, that would be 24 minutes a week. And yet, how many of us do that, right? My husband does that. I don't do that. See, I focus on how am I going to enjoy you know, what God's given me? Well, sure. How am I going to use this to create enjoyment and happiness in my life? I actually do that. Absolutely. Yeah, what I'm speaking of is intention, okay? If people understand that just 1% of their life on anything, whether it be money or anything, they focus and they devote to figuring out how to make people happy, figuring out how to make others happy, figuring out how to make the world around us better, just 1% and that awareness, that intention, a lot of really wonderful things can happen, a lot more. So I believe that it's the awareness of the intention and establishing the intention that's the first step. So I have a strategy for that that I used in business. So when I got up in the morning, as a manager, as a CEO of my company, my job, I felt, was, of course, to create business strategies and all that piece. But let's talk about people. My job was to make everybody underneath me successful. Absolutely. Whatever I needed to do to make them successful, that would make me successful. And so I would spend like five minutes in the morning, and I would have a piece of paper in front of me, and I would sit down and I would think about what I needed to do that day to make whatever was happening, the people that were doing it successful in what they were doing, whether it was just encouraging them. You know, if we study the personality types of the people that work with us and for us in businesses, that's a big deal. Let me tell you why it's important. It's kind of like a woo-woo thing I thought it was at the beginning. But if we take the time to look at people's personality types, we know what motivates them. So. I created a strategy intentionally to make the life of the people that worked for me better based on what motivated them. So I had people that were motivated by the at a girl, at a boy things. It really motivated them for me to tell them they were doing a good job. And so I intentionally sat down and I said, okay, for this person, they did this this week and empty guys as managers, empty, you did a great job this week. It doesn't do it for them. You specifically have to say the way that you handled that situation with that guest or the situation with that, you know, that client, that made a huge difference. And I really appreciate that. There are people that are motivated by money. 
And that's all that they really, if that is their motivation, but the person that's motivated by the at a guy, at a girl, they're not as motivated by money. They care more about knowing that they've made a difference. Absolutely. And by knowing these different personality types and taking the time in the morning, say, okay, what really means something to this person? What can I do to make them more efficient and make them happier? Happy employees make better production. All the difference. Yeah. Yeah. The last time we spoke, I had given you something to think about. And that was, if you're not getting enough, you're not giving enough. That's what I said, you right? Did if you're say not that. getting That's... enough, you're not giving enough. Yes. And the beautiful thing about what you just talked about, Linnell, is that you're talking about from the get go, the base of the whole foundation of what you just talked about is giving. Mm -hmm. You understand that, you know, giving to your employees and understanding what is meaningful to them in terms of your giving to them. Oh my gosh, that's huge. I mean, if everybody in business did that, and you are unbelievably successful businesswoman. I've been really fortunate. Right? And so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I said what I said. And so give first, right? Think about how much your world would be a better place if the people around you were happy. Totally. Yeah. And here's the thing. If you have somebody working for you that's not happy, I had a situation this week where we had someone working for us that was not happy. And they made sure to write me a letter that was like pages long in an email to read. I think it was like eight paragraphs, maybe 10. I don't know. It was long to let me know how unhappy they were. When you have someone working for you that's unhappy, and we're talking about creating happiness here, we're talking about being awareness of our intention to make the world a better place. The one thing that I said to this person was, you're not happy. You really are not. And you're not going to be happy here. Based on the email that you sent, there is no negotiation. You're not asking what we can do to work together. You're basically saying, I'm unhappy and here are all the reasons. And part of that was being accountable. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> even though we are intentionally looking to make our business more successful, make it a happier place. That's not done by skirting accountability. No, that's right. So I said to this person, I believe that you're going to be much happier somewhere else. Here's a month's severance. Go find something different. Good for you. So you have to recognize that what affects your happiness in the business, in the office. Guys, sometimes it's much better just to cut ties with toxic people because they're making everybody else in your workplace unhappy too. And how did the other people in your workplace feel about that decision? They were very happy. Actually. Right. And I didn't realize. Yeah. Yeah. And you've heard me say this, right? That I fired clients and I encourage everybody <laughs> to fire clients, right? Yes. I mean, the circle of life, let it happen. And yeah. And it's really hard because sometimes, I mean, you want to help people, you want them to be happy, but you talked about accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, I call it a culture of blame and explain that. A culture of blame? Yeah, tell me about that. So, you know, blame is a culture that we are all in right now. And the result of blame is victimhood. And right now, as I see the world, I see victimhood on the rise. And I look around and I go, you know what? Where's the accountability? And that's where the self-empowerment comes from, right? And I mentioned that about my book. That book right there is called American Grit. There's my finger. <laughs> it's called American Grit. But, you know, it's about self-empowerment versus blame. But the underlying theme of this is you can be a victim and you can blame the world for your circumstances, or you can just deny that and say, you know what? My life is my life and I have my own dreams. I have my own goals. I'm going to go after it myself. And that's part of the thesis that I'm trying to communicate and share with people. And it's interesting because sometimes when I share that and I talk to people about it, they go, Oh, whoa. Yeah, that's true. You know, whenever I feel like a victim, I'm not happy. I don't feel as powered. I feel like my personal power has been diminished. And so that's what I mean by that. I think that as managers, when you're managing in business, we all have those times where we feel like we're not empowered to do things. But I would encourage people, one of the lessons learned for being successful in business is being decisive. So if you see a situation where there's like 
I'm going to say unpositive or negative energy coming towards you. I don't know if you, or you know, as a manager, when you're around somebody, you can tell when they're not happy. Totally. And if you're around someone that's not happy, guys, they're probably making the rest of your staff unhappy. So (laughs) be decisive there. The other thing is you mentioned something about, you know, you fired clients. Mm -hmm. So there's a property manager, very successful property manager in this business. He's built three or four businesses all of them property management companies, and finally built something for himself. And he's got several now. And he worked for other people for a long time. But one of the things he did was he empowered his staff. And every year in December, they would go through their homeowners. Okay. And they were allowed to fire two or three homeowners that were making their lives miserable. Now, what that did, if you think about it, what that did, of course, you're going to look at the revenue that you might lose, right? You look at the revenue and how important that is. And a lot of times it's some of the very most successful homeowners that are the hardest to work with. So you have a choice. You can either assign that homeowner someone in your office who is capable of handling it without being unhappy and without taking it personally, or you can fire them. And that created enormous empowerment for his staff, which is important. And it also made the place happier, happier place to work. So I thought that was a great strategy. I was impressed with that. Let's talk for just a minute about enjoying life. When we talk about enjoying life, like I was up till two o'clock in the morning working last night. I do that a lot. I work until I get to a place that I'm comfortable stopping. I think that's a part of being an entrepreneur. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I like to work. Uh, It gives me great pleasure to create, to see something finished that I'm working on. Right now, I'm working on a budget for 2024 for one of the companies that I have. And so it's a lot of work because we have a big vision for what we want to do for 2024. And you guys probably do too in your business. What do you want to do? And so I sit down and I create a budget and find out what resources we have to have to make that happen. But enjoying life isn't about working less. That's what I wanted to say. Because I enjoy that a lot. That's true. So you define enjoying life for me. So enjoying life for me is knowing what I enjoy and making sure I make that a priority. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Two things you said. I always like to riff on what you talk about, Linnell. You mentioned that you work hard. (laughs) Hard work is a gift. It's a gift. And, you know, I talked about last time about muscles. The more you use a muscle, the stronger that muscle gets. I encourage people to exercise that muscle of hard work Mm. because it's something that serves you forever and it just becomes a part of you. You know, you and I kind of share that. I retired. I retired a year and a half ago, and I haven't worked so hard in a long, long time, but I'm doing my podcasts and I'm working with people on my book and I'm doing the things I want to do. And if I stopped working, I would die. I mean, you know, there's statistics that say, you know, a certain percentage of there people are. who stop working and retire, they die within the first 12 months. It's very and real. the other thing that you said was you have a big vision for your company. You have a big vision. So you have that reason. You and your staff have that reason. You have that broader vision Mm -hmm. of what you guys are trying to accomplish and you're working towards it. You're marching towards it. And that too is a gift. Yes. Right? Creating that vision so that people know what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing, I think is a big, big part of it. And we talked about designing your life last time we were here. Vision is a huge part of it, right? Is a huge, huge part of it. Why are you here? You know, why are you working? You know, what's the broader thing that you're trying to accomplish? And going for it and just being aware of it. It's not going to happen overnight. Some things can happen overnight, right? But you're marching towards it. The intention is really important. What I taught on yesterday, I did a teaching, put it up on YouTube on my husband's channel. And what I was teaching on is, well, I started out by saying, what's the meaning of life? You know, what is the meaning of life? That's a big one. It is. And there's a whole book in the Bible about that. And so... I talked about how to enjoy your life and what a gift it is if you can enjoy your life. So if you're not goal-oriented, if you don't put your goals out, you'll never meet those goals. So it's February. Okay, so I don't know when this is going to air, but I can tell you that it's February right now. And if you haven't sat down with your staff and said, here's what we want for 2024, they need that vision too. We shared that vision in December. So at the end of December, we shared that vision with everybody in the company and all of our donors, everybody that is a part of the ministry and who listens to, my husband's a podcaster too. 
I don't know if you knew that or not. Mm -mm. He has like, I don't know, a thousand hours of video on YouTube, but he does podcasts as well. And so we shared our vision. And now my job, guys, as administrator, as running this thing, just like you in a property management company, is to make that happen. We have to sit down and count the cost, find out, and be intentional in the morning. What am I doing to make this happen? Is what I'm doing today making happen what my vision is for 2024? So I think it's really important that we don't become a victim and say, I just couldn't make it happen like you were talking about. Let's be awareness of the intention in our life and what we're working toward. So making that happen by working toward it every day. Can I share something with you? Sure. Okay. I want to read to you. And this is something that I've shared with a lot of people in my own life. Good. And this is from a book. It's called Goals by Brian Tracy. And there's just one little thing I want to share with you that says it all. And I'm going to read this to you. Mark McCormick, in his book, What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School, tells of a Harvard study conducted between 1979 and 1989. In 1979, the graduates of the MBA program at Harvard were asked, have you set clear written goals for your future and made plans to accomplish them? It turned out that only 3% of the graduates had written goals and plans. 13% had goals, but they were not in writing. Fully 84% had no specific goals at all, aside from getting out of school and enjoying the summer. Wow. Ten years later, in 1989, the researchers interviewed the members of that class again. They found that the 13% who had goals that were not in writing were earning, on average, twice as much as the 84% of students who had no goals at all. Twice as much. But most surprisingly, they found that the 3% of graduates who had clear written goals when they had left Harvard were earning on average 10 times as much as the other 97% of graduates altogether. The only difference between the groups was the clarity of the goals they had for themselves when they graduated. That's a remarkable statistic. I didn't know that. But I tell you what we need to do, guys. We don't just need to make goals for our business. We need to have personal goals. Yeah. I was looking back at 2015. I journal every day. And I put down, not only do I put my goals down, but I put my dreams down. You know, if this is what I want. And I put in my journal that I wanted a home that had lots of windows and lots of light. At the time I had been leveraging my business for so long, I didn't own a home. You know, I was renting and I also wanted it to be on the water. So here was my vision. Okay. I'm going to share with you my vision. My vision was I would have a rental, I'd rent a condo or I'd buy a condo somewhere in Cary, North Carolina on one of these little man-made lakes like they have an apartment building, you know, like on the fourth, fifth floor that had like a fountain in it and you could watch the fountain at night. And I was like, I'll sit down on the porch and watch the fountain. And that was my dream. Now, I didn't specify that it would be a condo, but in my head, I was like, okay, that's probably what I'll have. And fast forward to eight years later. And I'm sitting here looking at the water right now as we speak. I'm looking at the ocean and I have a house and the whole bottom floor is made of glass and it's an oceanfront vacation rental. And I never dreamed of the amount of success that I would have. I knew that I would work hard and I really love business and I love real estate and I love vacation rentals, but I never imagined in my wildest dreams how successful the business would be and how God would open up this door for me to do this now. So I think not only do we need to write down our goals for our business and what we want to do in life, we need to do it on the other side too, guys. In order to make the world a better place, you need to create happiness. And I think it begins with creating happiness for yourself and those around you, like your family. So writing down those goals for what makes you happy, you know, and the other thing is, the last thing I want to say about that is finding pleasure in life. Guys, our life is short. We work all the darn time. We have to find ways to find pleasure, whether it's stopping at lunchtime and forcing yourself to go out on a 30-minute walk and reflect on what's happening for the day. That's very powerful for managers. I will tell you, that is powerful. That and writing down do you know that if you journal, it helps with depression? Absolutely. There are studies that somewhere in Boston, 
there are two different studies that show that if you journal it, it helps alleviate depression. And so does walking. So thinking about those things, we have to create a plan to make our world that we live in and our personal lives a better place, guys. If you don't create a plan, nobody's going to do it for you. So take yourself five minutes in the morning. Now, I do it with devotions. I open the Bible and I pray. You know, I ask God, you know, to help me do what I'm doing. But sitting down and having that time to yourself, it'll change your life. It starts there, you know, and we talked about, by the way, when you set goals for your business, you should set goals for yourself too. Mm -hmm. We need to set goals for ourselves first, you know, and this is just to show you that my money is where my mouth is. You can't see it, but it's got my one-year goals, my two-year goals, my life goals, and my five-year goals. And I have it right here framed, sitting in front of me. That's and powerful. that's what I do. You know, you said, I want to share a story about my house, right? So this was almost 30 years ago. We're looking for a house in Bellevue, Washington. And I told my realtor, asked me, John, what do you want in a house? And I said, I want a single story home with a view. And she said, stop right there. Okay. Single story homes don't have views because views are on hills and all hill homes are two story homes. I said, okay, well, I want a single story home with a view. Okay. She says, so what else? I said, and outside my home, I want to have the neighborhood mailbox. I want a street light and I want a fire hydrant. And she goes, what? I said, that's what I want. And she says, are you kidding me? And she says, never mind. And she turns to my wife. She says, okay, so let's be real. What do you want? Now, this is a testament to the fact that things happen. Sometimes things take time and sometimes things happen pretty quickly. In this case, two weeks later, I get a phone call from one of my neighbors saying, hey, John, just want to let you know my neighbor died. And her house is going up for estate. You might want to come by because they're going to sell it. So I call up my realtor. We go into the house. Within 30 seconds of entering the house, my realtor is on the phone to the selling realtor saying, we're buying this house. We're going to submit a full price offer. Within 30 is seconds. That everything? We bought the house. It was a single story home with a view, with a street lamp, the fire hydrant, and the mailbox right in front of the house. Wow. I don't know how this stuff works, but it works. Try it. You might like it. And if it doesn't work for you, <laughs> nothing better, nothing gained. It's, it's okay, You've lost right? nothing. Exactly. You've lost nothing, but just a little bit of time thinking about what you actually want. Exactly. You know, Bellevue, where you are, has some of the most successful real estate agents in the business. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal area for real estate agents who are well-educated. Some of my favorite people that I met in real estate business are in that market. I don't know anything about the market. I just know they're from there. That's true. Is there anything else that you want to tell our property managers or whoever's listening? Yeah. You know, just one thing. I interviewed a gentleman who had written a book and he'd written a book about inclusion and diversity and equity. And I don't know about you, but I have very mixed feelings about that whole movement, some of which is very positive, some of which is pretty darn negative. And one of the things that he talked about, though, that really resonated with me was creating a culture of belonging. And what we talked about was that, you know, belonging and helping people feel like they belong. I mean, that's just a human need is a need to feel like you belong somewhere, right? And we talked about that and we talked about how much I don't understand the people around me. And one of the stories I said was, you know, I've been married for almost 40 years and I still don't understand what women go through. And I certainly don't know what they go through at work, but just something as simple as knowing what they go through, knowing what women go through when they walk to their car at night in a dark parking lot. <laughs> I don't think twice about it. I just go to my car and I'm off, right? But, you know, there's just something as simple as that, let alone right. the whole workplace environment and, you know, that whole thing. And so yeah, we really got into how do you create belonging? And it's all about just being, not just, but being sensitive and understanding yes. the other person's perspective and also reading the room, right? He gave an example of if you're in a meeting and there's one person who's not participating, Call that person out. A lot of times they want to be recognized. They're afraid to make comments because they're afraid their comments are going to be viewed as stupid. Or you have a situation where somebody makes a comment and then later on in the meeting, the boss makes the same comment and everybody says to the boss, what a great idea that was. 
right? <laughs> Call it out and say, hey, you know what? Louise just made that same comment 20 minutes ago. I think we need to give her some credit for that idea. And one of the things that I'm going to kind of promote is years and years ago, you might remember this, but there was a series of books called A Day in the Life Of, right? And I would love to encourage people, guys like me, any gentlemen, any men, all men. Okay, here's the thing. Spend a day in the life of a woman. You don't have to wear a dress, <laughs> but you know what? I mean, learn, follow, and understand what they go through. And that one day, if you do that, I promise you, will change your perspective forever, right? Yeah, it will. I have a story. Let me tell you a quick story that many women will be able to relate to. So when I took over the business and bought it for my partner, I hired some people to work with me that were really mentors to me. Some of the best people I've met in my entire life, and we're still very close friends. And one of my very close friends, when we would go into business meetings together, would take over the meeting, even though it was my meeting and it was my company and I was running everything, we would have people in. And it was a really important meeting. But this happened twice. And what would happen is they would talk over me and they would Okay, you're going to understand this if you're a woman. They would treat me like the little miss. That's what I call it. It's not overt. It's actually rather covert. And my friend had no idea that this is what he was doing. He's a very strong leader, and he would just take over the conversation. And he would kind of push me under the rug. Now, in business, if you're a woman, you've learned to handle those situations, period. Everybody does. There were clients that I wouldn't work with that I would send men to talk to because they didn't respect women. And I'm sorry, it still exists in business and I don't take offense at it. It's an educational thing that we have to think about as women. So what I did, let me tell you how I handled it. If you have that happening to you, I took this person aside the first time and I said, that won't work for me. Let's not do that again. Here's what happened. And they were like, oh, I didn't realize that. The second time it happened, I took him aside and I said, hey, this happened again, and it's not going to happen again. I'll just not take you into any of the meetings. You can just stay out of the meetings if it's going to be like this. And he was like, Linnell, I did not realize that. And it wasn't that he was disrespecting me. Mm -hmm. He was like protecting me. I'm going to tell one more story. I had an attorney. If you're in business and you have an attorney, uh, they're a really vital part. And when I was doing my transaction to sell my company, he actually refused to finish. And then this is like, I don't know how many, $75,000 in, refused to finish the transaction for me because he said it was a bad deal for me and that he could not in good conscience, you know, finish the transaction because he didn't believe that it would be profitable for me. Well, millions and millions of dollars later, he's obviously wrong. He was wrong then. And I paid him out of that $75,000 and sent him an email. And I said, look, I'm going to report you to the board. And I'm also going to pay you $15,000 because that's the number of hours that you actually deserve because you didn't finish the rest of my transaction. And you cost me, he almost cost me the deal. So my best friend is an attorney. She's a strong corporate attorney. And the reason she told me to go with this other guy is there's this gazillionaire and he was like, use my guy. He'll only charge you $75,000 to do the thing. And I'm like, great, that's wonderful. And my attorney said, it's going to cost you about $250,000. So guess what? I had to go back to the drawing board use my corporate attorney who, <laughs> okay, it is what it is, what it costs to do business. It's a cost of doing business. But after selling the company, the attorney, when you think about what he did, it's disrespectful as if I didn't know what I was doing. I've been in business for, you know, 17 years at that point. I knew the people that I was dealing with personally. So if he didn't think it was a bad deal, you know, good deal is his day. Anyway, we see this in all different areas as women. What we have to remember is that a lot of times it's not intentional. They're not intentionally treating you differently. We do get intentionally paid differently, that I will tell you. It's just statistical analysis if you study it. I don't understand that. But we as women should take time to build other women up in the business. We should. And we do that. Actually, in vacation rentals, we have a lot of groups. And if you want to belong to one of these groups, let me know where we just got together a whole group of us, vacation rental managers and some vendors who got together. We took the personality test. We talked about how important that was. 
so that as leaders, we could go back into our companies with that information. It was just something that Sue Jones, who is a wonderful person, and everybody in Vacation Rentals knows Sue Jones. She's done so many teachings on HR. She's like consults and all that. But Sue has been in the business for many years. Yeah. And she just gave everybody, she's like, go take this test and we'll go get together and talk about it. Women supporting women. How do we make the world a better place? Intentionally, one of the ways is that we support people that are going through the same thing we are. And as women, I think it's important that we build women. And I believe that it is important for all of us to build women, Mm. for men to build women. And Mm -hmm. imagine how much better the world would be if men made it an intention to understand and to understand your perspective, the perspectives that you just shared. And, you know, we're curious. We talked about curiosity, right? And we talked about curiosity leading to Mm open-mindedness. And this is one of those things. And gentlemen, you know what? I don't know about you, but the most important person in my life is a woman. I just want to echo what you said, Linnell, from a man's perspective, (laughs) whatever. But someone like me, yeah. So this guy is still my best friend who did that. He's still one of my very best friends. Would never have done anything intentionally. So a lot of times when we're dissed, guys, it's not intentional. It's really not. My husband is one of the most fair and equal people I know. And that was one of the reasons I just was so shocked that he's just perfect. Anyway, I don't want to go into that, but he's perfect. One of the things I did want to say is you were talking about a culture of belonging. This is important. We have to be aware that there are not just personality types that we work for. Some of the smartest people I know are autistic. My son and my husband both have Asperger's and they're brilliant. They never feel like they belong anywhere. So there are going to be people that work for you that may be really, really smart. They're never going to feel like they belong anywhere. They still don't. Like we can go to a family reunion with all of my family who adore them. They're just sweet, kind. There's nobody with a kinder spirit than people who have Asperger's. A lot of them are very, very sweet and kind. And that is from my experience, but they never felt like they belong. And when we left the family reunion, they were like, I didn't feel like I belonged there. And I don't know, but there is someone who can teach us how to include people better in the business. That part of finding out what motivates people will help them feel like they belong, though. Oh, it will help the business. It'll help you be successful. It'll help your clients that or whoever it is you talk to, your guests. It will go around. And it'll help your business. That's very good. And yeah, it'll make you a happier person. Let's be happier people, guys. And and it'll lift your spirit. And when your spirit's lifted, your life is lifted. When your life is lifted, the world is lifted. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> John, I look forward to listening to your podcast too. And I pray that God will continue to bless you as you help the world be a better place. And likewise, because you're doing the exact same thing, Linnell. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, John. And thanks for being on the podcast. Hey, guys, don't forget that John's going to be at Live Res, their PMS conference that they have. They have the most fun. If you've never been to the Live Res one, there are two that I just adore in the industry. One is the Live Res one, and the second one is the Streamline one. They're so much fun. They're intentionally set to make fun for people. So you're going to have a good time there. Where is it at this year? It's in Texas, isn't it? <laughs> it's in Austin. Oh, yeah, so you- April 8th to the 10th. Well, good. Yeah, so I'll be there. Well, I hope you have a lot of fun there. I'm not sure if I'm going to be there or not. We'll have to see. If so, then I'll see you. Otherwise, we'll get together outside. And Okay. Thanks again, John. You bet. Thanks, Linnell. Bye. This episode of How We Grow is brought to you by LiveRes. To find out more about how LiveRes can help grow your vacation rental business, visit LiveRes.com. Make sure to search for How We Grow in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. On behalf of the team here at Inhabit, thanks for listening.